Hello, and thank you for tuning in today. Before we begin our discussion, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. My name is Elisa Zanola, and I'm head of events for the Fashion Scholarship Fund. As many of us are very familiar with Zoom at this point, there are some great features that we'd love for you to utilize. One of them is the chat box. Feel free to send comments to the panelists or other attendees. And there's also the Q&A box. As questions come to mind, we'd love for you to submit them and we'll answer as many as possible during the Q&A segment of the session. And now I'd like to introduce our executive director, Peter Arnold. Thanks, Lisa. Welcome, everybody, to the first of uh, nine weeks of summer scholar series programming that we're providing. Tuesdays are workforce preparedness sessions, Thursdays are master classes, and so this evening is our very first workforce preparedness course. And I can think of no better, more apt or appropriate topic than interviewing and onboarding best practices, how to land that dream role, and start off on the right foot. Um, I'm anxious to hear from all of our panelists and especially pleased that we're joined tonight um, by Aditi Sindhi, who's the Director of Talent Acquisition at PVH. Welcome, Aditi. Um, Tony Friedland, Director of Talent Acquisition at Wolverine. Welcome, Tony. Uh, Elaine Jackler, who's the Creative Talent Lead at Ralph Lauren. Thanks for joining us, Elaine. And our FSF friend and supporter, Brian Zaslow, who is the CEO and founder of JBC Holdings and tonight's moderator. Brian, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Thank you so much, Peter. And thanks everyone for joining us here tonight. Appreciate everybody's attendance and time. And although I do miss doing this in person with everyone, I'm, I'm super hopeful that the, uh, the time's coming soon where we can uh, see each other in person and get back to uh, a little live event. Um, hope everybody had a really good Memorial Day weekend. Here in New York, we were just joking about it, kind of felt like winter break. So uh, hopefully the sun will come out this week and we'll get closer and closer to summer and, and back to real life. I wanna just start with a, a couple of housekeeping things and a thank you first to the Fashion Scholarship Fund for hosting this wonderful event, kicking off the uh, Summer Scholar Series. A big thank you to Peter and Elisa and their team, as well as my colleagues, Lisa Berger and Ashley Kahn for putting this panel together and the event. Um, you know, as Peter and, and Elisa shared today, we're gonna to be having a, a very powerful and important discussion with three leading experts about workforce preparedness. It's a great topic and a, and a critical topic. And as we all know, this topic has shifted quite a bit over the last 15 months or so, thanks to COVID. And it's become an even more challenging and, and difficult landscape to navigate. So our teams at JBC Style and JBC Connect and our leadership search practice teams at Genu, we've made rich changes to our approach of supporting candidates and clients with their interview prep and, and, and their onboardings. And I'm really looking forward to spending some time here and sharing and hearing what Tony, Aditi, and Elaine have to share with us on a handful of important questions. So before we dive in, just two super quick housekeeping items. Uh, the first one is the goal of this panel is to try to wrap this up with 35 minutes of conversation from our panelists. And following tonight's session, uh, our teams at JBC and Genu have prepared some takeaway materials uh, for everyone who's in attendance, and those will be disseminated to you at some point post the event this evening. So, so diving in, uh, the first thing we're going to start with is pre-interview prep. Nothing more important, at least in my eyes, than walking into an interview prepared. Who are you meeting with? What is their background? How did they find their way into this role as the interviewer of you? So Tony, if you don't mind, we're going to throw this first question out to you. What questions do you suggest a candidate comes into an interview with you or one of your hiring managers prepared with ahead of time? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And I think that the answer is a question, right? Like you should have at least one to two questions prepared. So I don't think there's any magic recipe in terms of the questions that you should ask, but you should have one to two that you're uh, ready to ask. So if you haven't had the time to prep or you get nervous and you freeze kind of on the spot, some great questions to have in your back pocket are questions about the process, right? So what's the process? What's the timeline? What are the next steps? When can I expect to hear back? Those are pretty simple and safe questions. I would advocate you take the time to prepare and maybe jot down a question or two on a sticky note. So some questions I like to hear are maybe questions around 
Are there any other questions that I can answer for you? Is there anything else I can share about my experience uh, that might help you make your decision? Another great question is, what does success look like in this role? And, and what are, you know, what is a great candidate going to have or possess? Because what that does is it allows the interviewer to come back and share additional information with you. And then if you're quick on your feet, you could quickly kind of think about, hmm, they said success looks like this in this role. And maybe I didn't fully answer that question, or maybe there's something left unsaid. And then you can quickly pivot and share some additional information about your background or experience or a previous role that might help that interviewer, you know, understand and assess that, wow, this is a great candidate for this position. Really appreciate those answers. I, I find that the most important coaching we can always offer is to come prepared with something thoughtful, challenge your interviewer and, and, and just assert yourself as someone who's contributing to that conversation. Aditi, if you don't mind, I'd like to turn this next question over to you. Um, how do you suggest or would you suggest that a candidate broach compensation during their interview? Yes, it's my favorite topic, um, just to kind of know um, and, you know, put everything together. Definitely um, do your homework. Um, there are so many resources. There's Glassdoor, there's LinkedIn. Um, but also to know, oh, let me answer your question. Yes, absolutely. Give out your salary expectation. Um, expectation or compensation is made out of two parts. One is base and benefits. And benefits doesn't all, always cover a bonus. It, it could not, but it all, you know, it has other medical, dental, 401k, whatever it is, different companies offer different things. So I think um, you, you, you should be able to ask, hey, you know, what are the benefits package? It helps me understand the total compensation. Um, and I always say, hey, be confident of what you're asking. As long as you've done your homework, you can come back and say, um, you know, as far as I know, this is the range this job should sit in. I'm totally comfortable with that. Um, if you're not, if you're very flexible and you don't want to give out a range, you can even say, if this is the right role for me, um, I'm sure we can come up, at a, we can come to an agreement on salary if you're very flexible. Um, but definitely ask for it. I think it's important. Um, it's, there are some laws in some states now that, you know, don't, they're not able, like we as recruiters aren't able to ask or employers aren't able to ask your salary history. So if the question is, hey, what are your salary expectations? answer that, don't necessarily answer where you are or what you make, um, and that'll just make it easier to move on. Yeah, we, I've, I've found that often candidates are, are free to share, even if you're not soliciting, like in New York, that law applies here. Yeah. You yeah. can't solicit their salary, but if you ask them what they're looking for, oftentimes they will share. They will. We're not, we're, we don't note it down though. <laughs> no, agreed. I, I, you know, at JBC, one, the, the thing that you're speaking about we, we do a lot of preparation on for our screenings and we tend to call it cost of change. And I don't think, I think a good topic for candidates sitting here tonight to, to contemplate is the, the, this premise of your cost of change. Your cost of change is so far beyond just the salary you're making or the bonus structure you may or may not have, but maybe at the job you're currently employed at, you get to have summer Fridays and you're moving into a new company that doesn't offer that. That's a cost. It's a viable cost against you or for you, depending upon the environment you're moving to or equity that might be on the table or you're moving to a company that now pays 100% of your benefits, whereas before you had to contribute 40% towards your benefits, that's a big cost of change in the positive for you. So all really important topics when, when you're having that discussion. Yeah, it's a wide range of things. I also, sorry, I just want to add one more thing. It's okay to give out a range for your salary expectations. Don't always think it has to be a number. It can be a 10 to 15K range, depending on what the role is. For maybe a junior level, 5 to 7K range. And for a more professional, it can be 10 to 15K range. Yeah. Awesome. So, Elaine, we're going to come to you with our, our third question for this pre-interview prep section. We're obviously not living in 2019 anymore. The blinders are off and the world has changed. Interviews have been and seem to continue to be virtual. 
Can you share your best virtual interview tips with our audience? Absolutely. And, you know, it's virtual interviewing is not going away, um, even as companies start to return into the office. So one of the things that we found over the last year are a number of benefits of the virtual interview. Um, it's convenient. It's more convenient for the hiring manager. It's convenient for the scheduler. It's convenient for the candidate. So um, no more travel, not as much waiting, no expense. So um, we're going to continue to see the virtual interviewing. I think what's important to understand though is that virtual interviewing can mean more than one thing because there are live virtual interviews, just like um, a, an in-person interview. Um, it's a two-way conversation. Um, that conversation could also include a panel, um, but there is a two-way conversation. The other thing that um, many people are not as aware of, and it's something that we're seeing more of, is what would be referred to as a on-demand, asynchronous or one-way interview. And so there are multiple virtual interviews happening right now. Um, what's important to know is with the, the one-way interview, it's truly that, it's one way. Questions are, are popping up, um, they could be written, they could be pre-recorded, um, and the the candidate applicant really needs to be prepared to have a one-way conversation. It's very uncomfortable. There are no cues. There's nobody nodding on the other side, agreeing with what you said. Um, and so prepping for that is very, very important. So when I think about prepping for a virtual interview, it's all the things that go into play for an in-person interview, right? You're thinking about what you're wearing, so dressing for success, and that means dressing for what is appropriate for the role and the company that you're interviewing with. Um, so finding out ahead of time, what is the, um, the dress code? What would be appropriate for, for the interview? You don't wanna show up wearing a suit, if you're applying to say a performance, athletic performance uh, company. So um, dress for success is, um, is somewhat subjective. The other thing that needs to be considered is technology. Do you have the right, um, I guess application, um, will it work well on, on your, laptop, your phone, whatever type of equipment you're going to be using for the interview. Be, you'll do want to do a test run with Zoom, with Microsoft Teams. Do that ahead of time to be prepared. Um, location, right? I actually had to move. You can see the sun is glaring in my eyes. I had to move, shift myself a bit in order to be on this call. Um, but ensuring that you have a quiet space, a space where um, it's not cluttered um, and distracting in the background um, and, and that it's clean. So, you know, we have found that um, candidates are interviewing in their bedrooms, in their kitchens, in an office, in a living room, um, and all of that's okay. Um, just make sure it's uncluttered um, behind, behind. And the fourth piece of, um, of advice I would give is really around practice, because not everybody feels comfortable talking um, you know, on Zoom. Um, so if you're not, uh, find a friend, a family member, and um, take some time having the conversations, asking questions, you know, having that friend or family member or guidance counselor, uh, you know, career counselor, um, sit down with you and work through those. Um, record yourself um, and ensure that you're feeling comfortable with what you're seeing. Um, the other thing that I would say and I'm doing some quick looks in my notes, make sure you do some research. What are those potential questions that could be asked? You can find those by Googling um, 
What questions are asked to Company X during an interview? You can find it on Glassdoor. You can find it on Indeed. So get those um, practice questions ready. Um, ask them to yourself and record an answer so you're prepared for those one-way um, interviews. And ensure that you smile. You look into the camera. You're bringing your authentic self to the interview uh, because you you are selling yourself, right? And that's the idea of the interview. So make sure you're, you're still being personable. And the best thing I can also say as my dog is knocking at the door, be okay with the unexpected. The dog's gonna bark, somebody's gonna ring the doorbell, the landscaper's going to show up next door. You have no control of that and, and acknowledge it. Don't be afraid of it. And, and everything will be okay. Awesome and outstanding advice on all of that, Elaine. Thank you so much. And, and when you're done with Ralph Lauren, don't let anybody hear me. There's a, there's a whole bunch of new Pacta for you with all that. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. <laughs> but but I think everybody really appreciates all of that because we are living in a bizarre world. We're doing this virtually. We're doing all of these interviews. You know, as a recruiter supporting tons of companies, I got to tell you, I've seen everything in a Zoom background by now, things that should not be on people's walls or outfits. We were talking about this conversation just a week and a half ago, and, and I had mentioned, you know, what does everybody think about a candidate who's wearing a nice dress shirt? And you see them lean back and they're wearing a pair of camo cargo shorts or, or workout <laughs> shorts. You know what? It's the world we're living in represent yourself and and you know the, the the call and the conversation and the environment needs to have professionalism but all bets are off now things are definitely different very true very true the other thing is when you start the interview if you expect an interruption it's okay to say you know my dog's here right she may bark and i apologize it's all it's all great I've, I have two feisty labs, a black lab and a chocolate lab, and they are not here tonight for that reason. So, <laughs> um, you know, before we move to the next topic, just wrapping up this pre-interview prep, I obviously posed a, a specific question to each of you, but do are, any of you have anything you'd like to put out there that, that wasn't covered that you'd like to share with the audience you think is important? No? Okay. Good, so let's move to the next topic. Because of this awesome advice everybody just received, the interview's over and you crushed it. You guys did great, um, super successful. So now what? So our next topic here is going to be post-interview insights and tips. And I'm gonna start off with Aditi. First question is to you. So thank you notes, especially nowadays where we're doing a lot of virtual interviewing. What are the do's and don'ts after an interview when it comes to thank you notes now? Yeah always do thank you notes. Absolutely, yes on that. Um, I think I, I think any, an overnight is okay. Like next day, send a thank you note. You, if you send it too early, you might seem a little too de uh, desperate or sometimes it looks like you were just trying to check it off your list that day. So an overnight, I wouldn't say, you know, within 24 hours, send a thank you note. Send individual ones to each panelist, the, each interviewer. Um, if you don't have their email address, get it from whoever the first contact was or um, send it to them and they can forward it. But definitely cover first, you know, start off with how thankful you are for the opportunity to interview. Um, if they're, you're able to remember um, about a moment in that interview, Mention that it's that again, making that personal connection for just a split second with that um, interviewer. And that's important. And they sort of get, because just the way you are um, attending all these interviews, they're interviewing other candidates. So how do they remember you? That one little connection they made with you on the call. Um, and so mention that if there's an opportunity um, and then end with how, um, you know, remind them how you are great for the role again. And, and I want to say this letter needs to be like an essay. It's, you know, it's, it's a thank you note. It's not an essay. You don't need to explain everything. I've gotten some crazy thank you essays. Um, I, one I actually hung in my office to be like, how not to send thank you notes. Um, so definitely short, it's a note. 
one line for each of these that I'm saying. And then in the end, just remind them why you're good for it and that you are very excited about opportunity and the next steps and your contact information. And that's it. Awesome. Thank you, Aditi. So we, Elaine, other than the thank you note, moving that to the side for the moment, can you share with the, our audience here tonight any suggestions and insights you have into proper follow-up best practices? No one wants a stalker, as we know, um, but is follow-up okay generally and how to do it? Yes, and actually I just got a, off a call working with somebody on how to follow up. So follow-up is, is very appropriate to do. You know, usually um, after an interview, the, you might hear, oh, I'll get back to you by a certain date, um, and then you don't hear back, right? So at that point, if you haven't heard back after the date that was given to you, <laughs> tip number one, <laughs> wait until after, um, then it, it's fine to drop a note and just say, hi, how was your weekend? I hope you enjoy the holiday. Um, just following up to see um, where we are in the process. It, two to three sentences, nothing more, right? And then one of four things is going to happen. Your, the response will be, oh, perfect timing. I was just going to get back to you. Here are the next steps. Could be a response of, we're still working through some things. We, we're going to need a little more time. The Fourth thing, a uh, third thing might be, um, you know, we're, we're not going to be moving forward, but at least you now have an answer. And, and the fourth, and but fortunately could be nothing. Um, and although it's not a practice that anybody lives by, it does happen sometimes. So um, you, you would have that. And if you do get a nothing, I would say within a week or so, you follow up one more time. Um, and hopefully you, you'd get a response, but you know, after that, I would say that you, you let it go. Yeah, time, time kills all deals in our business and, and the interview process and hiring. So after that second one, it's uh, the, the writing is typically on the wall. Um, so Tony, you get the best of all worlds here. Thank you notes and follow up. We'd love to hear you weigh in and, and share your insights. Yeah, I think there are a lot of great suggestions and tips. I think for me personally, I, you know, send one to everyone like a tip. It, it's a little bit of a little bit of a trick, but um, I like to see what candidates are resourceful enough to know that they can look at the calendar invite in that the name of the person that they interviewed with in their email will be on the calendar invite, right? So do that instead of reaching out to the recruiter and saying, you know, hey, I don't have so and so's email address. If they send you a calendar invite, you do have the email address, right? So look at that. You've got all the information you need. Send those thank you notes out. Um, I love the 24 hour rule. And, and I guess my biggest rule is be patient be polite and don't pester, right? Sometimes things move slower than the recruiter um, thinks they're going to do, right? People are on vacation, um, you know, you had a last minute candidate thrown into the mix. I mean, things happen. So be patient and when you do follow up, just make sure that you're being professional and courteous and not insistent. I have had some that, you know, you said you were going to reach out by and I haven't heard what is going on. That is not how I would recommend doing it, right? So just gently kind of nudge, send that reminder and then whatever that response is back to you, let that be your response. Yeah, Th thank you for all of that. I, I guess I would follow all of that up with just the reminder, we're in a creative space not all industries are, but this is a, a creative industry, even if the role and function you're in is not. And then we've got, especially here tonight, we have a, 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 a lot of young generation getting into work um, as an audience here. I think for both of those, the creative and the youthful that are just starting their careers, there, there tends to historically be this inclination, maybe I should write a hand thank you. It'll go a long distance. I, I don't know if you guys would agree as a panel, but I think that those times have kind of gone by the wayside and it's time to lose sight of that and, and realize instantaneous is what everybody expects because of the digital world we're living in. 
you can't get a card there in 24 hours, don't send the card. And most people aren't even in the office to get it. Um, yeah, so, you know, it, same question as I posed before, before we move on to the next topic is, is there anything that the three of you would like to cover on, on, on any of these points about thank you notes or follow up or anything else concerning the post interview before we move on? Great. So our, our last focus tonight is uh, onboarding in a remote world. Uh, interesting topic, but uh, obviously a very relevant and an important one today. So never thought we'd be here. Uh, definitely was not thinking about this in 2019. We actually were doing the opposite, trying to figure out a way to stop employees and colleagues who said, well, I want to work from home and not come into the office anymore. I'm like, huh, that's just not going to work. But here we are, and it's great. We love it. Um, and I won't change it ever in our office. And from the sound of it, most of our clients are the same. They'll always have the option of, of several buckets. Um, so diving into this last segment, I'm, I'm going to kick off with you, Elaine. You know, what, what best practices can you share here with this audience for onboarding now in, in po this post-COVID world we're, we're living in? All right. Um, well, I'm going to attack this one in two ways, right? Because there's the corporate onboarding and then it's also as a new hire what can you do to to help with a successful onboarding um onboarding has been a challenge and um we we, we as, at ralph lauren we've done a, a really good job at looking at how do we onboard our employees right because we have uh equipment that needs to get to our new um, new employees homes we have in some cases we might have actual um, uh, fit you know the models for our technical designers you know so we have a lot of things that we need to actually um, the silhouettes uh, not the models themselves you know um, into to people's homes so we have physical um, belongings that need to get to our new hires. But then in addition to that, it's, um, you know, the virtual payroll and benefits and orientation. Um, so we have started to do, the, uh, we, we have all those things we've been doing really since, since March. But we've, we do take it a step further because our onboarding process includes meet and greets, learning and development programming, um, and so we're doing all of that as well. If you join a company that doesn't have an official onboarding program, I would say as a new hire, there would be a few things that you'd want to do. You'd want to sit down with your hiring manager um, and or your, your human resources partner or the recruiter who brought you into the company and ask a number of questions. Who should I be meeting? Right. Who, who are the stakeholders? Who are the people beyond my initial team that I should get to know? And once you find out, say, who's gonna introduce me? Will you introduce me or should I introduce myself? I can send an email and get, and get on the calendar, 30 minutes, meet and greet, understand who's out there. Um, the, the other thing you, you'll wanna do also with your hiring manager and or recruiter, human resource partner, to find out what type of learnings you should be attending. Are there programs that you need to learn? Are there courses you should be taking? Make sure you sign up for those. And then um, the last thing is just trying to, oh, I'm, I'm going into my next question, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and it was around culture. Brian, may I, may I, may I keep on going? Go culture, with that culture, because it, it does <laughs> keep on going. <laughs> it it does fall into it to the onboarding process. Is really understanding the company's culture and how you can be embedded into it, especially when you're you're not in the office on a day to day basis and seeing things and understanding what's important and. and and touching. I mean, we have a, a library that and archives that we love to share. And we can't share that right now. So how does one understand a culture? And this is where you have an opportunity to continue to sign up. 
Are there volunteer opportunities, even if they are virtual, that you can join? Are there speaker series? Um, do, does the company do programming around Pride Month, Women's International Month? Sign up for all, as many of those things as you can, because not only will you have the opportunity to hear from other employees, but you'll have the opportunity to see what's important you know, to the company and to that company culture, and it'll give you a lot of insight. So I've tied culture into onboarding because it is um, all encapsulating. And, and I love this because Aditi and Tony are going to cover some topics also in this in a moment. But I think for the audience, these are great things to take note of because these are important questions to be asking in your interview process now as well. You know, how are you supporting the development and, and furthering your culture now that everybody is remote? What are you doing to have best practices to onboard people so they have a familiarity and a comfort and they don't get lost in the mix for their first three weeks at work or they're underprepared? Those are all, you know, th this list is something that I think everybody should take note of and, and jot them down and bring into those conversations. Um, Tony, coming to you for some advice and guidance for our audience tonight, how, how would you suggest they properly navigate the, the, you know, a new organization and even more importantly, get to know the people who they're now calling colleagues or managers or leaders? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And that's really hard in a virtual world, right? So I recently, um, so I kind of grew up in the learning and development space, right? And uh, at uh, last March, I switched roles with the company and moved from learning and development to talent acquisition. And I had the benefit of being with the company, right? Being with Wolverine for 20 plus years. So I knew the people, the players, who was who, but moving into that new role in a virtual world gave me a, a new appreciation for just how hard it is. So for a new hire that's coming in, they don't know the company, they don't know the culture, they don't know the people, right? They're trying to learn this job, just how challenging that was. And um, so some tips that I would suggest is lean on your manager and your HR business partner, right? So ask those questions. Um, who should I be speaking with? What other functions is this role going to interact with on a regular basis? What are the goals for this job, right? Um, what is, you know, one or two things that if I could be amazingly successful in my first year, you know, I would accomplish A or B. And that will give you insight from your manager into departments, people, um, you know, that you should connect with, as well as maybe some opportunity areas where you can look like a rock star and just go out, you know, proactively and start scheduling meetings. I'm a pretty assertive person. So I'm one that I'm like, I don't need an introduction. Um, I will just go out. I'll find you on the org chart. And I'll figure out who you are and I will send a very polite professional um, message, right? I would always tell people in the learning space, if you're looking for mentors, or people to help you. If you appeal to most people, right? Say, hey, I noticed that you have X years of experience or you're in this role or you've done this with your career. And I'd really love to tap your brain. Used to be, you'd say, can I buy you a cup of coffee, right? You don't really go buy people cups of coffee that much anymore. But you could say, you know, would you be willing to connect for 15 minutes? Most people are going to say yes, because they feel, um, you know, they, they feel a little, um, you know, hey, somebody noticed, somebody wants to talk to me, somebody wants to, you know, hear what I have to share. So don't be afraid to ask figure out who those people are, and then reach out and ask those people for a few minutes of their time. And then when you, you, you do that, right, then show up, be prepared, and be ready to, to rock it. And, and I'll cover that in a, a few minutes from now. Yeah, I, I love the assertive commentary, Tony, for a whole myriad of reasons. But the most important, I think this audience tonight, that's their hardest learning curve is how to just ask a question. We all have them. They're all sitting in our yeah. minds. But I you know, I, I think it's the most profound growing that I ever had was when I realized that pivotal moment that I could ask it and it was received well. I've just never stopped asking questions since or been transparent or been blunt. It's a, it's a great gift and I would encourage everyone to give it a shot with new opportunities or current employers. It's, uh, it, it's really helpful. 
And if, and if I might say so, because I saw a question that hopefully we'll get to, I would say, especially for women, I think oftentimes women put themselves into this, uh, you know, I don't want to bug somebody. I don't want to pest them. I don't want to ask this question. And, you know, when I coach and train my staff, I always say, well, what do you have to lose? They're either going to ignore your email or they're going to say, no, thanks. Not, you know, there's no repercussions to you for doing that. So you never know unless you try and unless you ask. And I say 99 times out of 100, that is going to be time well spent. So ask the question, get on the calendar and make the best use of that time that you can. Yeah, that's very fair. Thank you for that. So Aditi, we're looking for your guidance and wisdom here with this next question. How does someone manage accountability while they're remote? Gosh, um, it is, it, we have had to all learn, right? It's, it's different. You can't just walk over to somebody and, and talk about it and, or pull them in and be like, hey, do you have five minutes? Let me talk to you. Um, I, think, I think we have to use technology. I think understand what tools somebody, like what tools you have that you can use. Also this question, I mean, accountability as a, as a manager, as somebody starting new is, is different. So I'll, I'll, for this audience, I'll answer it for if you're starting new, understand all the different technology that is available in the company that you can use for yourself. Kind of go back to what Tony and Elaine were also talking about the communication, asking questions. Um, you know, a lot of companies now have internal messenger. So if you don't want to write an email, you don't want to call somebody, it's a quick, it's like a text. It's easier to do and ask and um, definitely ask your manager what is expected out of you. Do 30, 60, 90 day check-ins. Um, and, and for the first month, it's okay to have weekly check-ins to understand if you are doing everything that's expected out of you. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll just echo every, you have to ask questions. You will not know what is expected out of you and you cannot be that rock star Tony talked about unless you know what to do. Um, ask questions as long as you're being respectful and polite, um, they're always received well. They're, they're, I've never had any manager come out saying, what a silly question, like he's been here She's, they've been here two days and they ask this question and that doesn't happen. You ask the question, it'll be answered. And if you don't want to um, ask your manager, ask the HRBP, they're, that's what they're there for. They're there to support you um, through your journey in the company and, and uh, really help you succeed. Awesome. Thank you. And Tony, this one, next one's coming to you, although I think you've touched on it a bit already, but making the best possible first impression. Yeah. So then when you've identified those, those folks that you want to reach out to, right? So send that professional note um, or professional email and then, you know, be on time. Um, so, you know, that's always be respectful of their time since you asked for their time. And then have a clear agenda of what it is you want to cover, right? So there's nothing more frustrating when somebody asks you for your time, you agree, you show up, and then you just stare at each other. Um, and I think that's harder virtually, right? Because when we're face-to-face, -face, we tend to read those, those kind of cues, which are a little bit harder to pick up sometimes on Zoom. Um, while I think we're all getting better at it, right? Um, I, I would say know what you want to cover, come in with a clear agenda, thank the person for their time, and then launch right into, you know, hi, Elaine, thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm new to the company, and I just wanted to take 15 minutes to pick your brain and talk about ABC, right? So Elaine knows very clearly what it is that I'm trying to get out of this conversation. That way we can make it a productive conversation. And then very similar to an interview, I would say once you've wrapped it up, um, send a thank you note, right? Take a, a second to send a quick thank you, you know, for their time, maybe share a tidbit or two of, you know, what you learned during the conversation, or maybe a nugget of information that you're going to take and apply or do something with, so that it tells that person that, hey, not only did I appreciate your time, engage in the conversation, but there's going to be an outcome or a result, um, you know, as a result of the conversation. Yeah, totally agreed. I think some of the, the, the real obvious ones are, are super important also. 
they're not necessarily going to make a good first impression if you do them, but to not do them is critical. Simple stuff like you're, you're, we're living in this digital era in this virtual world. Don't get distracted by your cell phone. Don't reply to an email or type on the keyboard while you're having that, that banter with someone you're meeting for the first time, a peer, a colleague, a manager, a leader. I think we're all probably guilty of it. I've sat in way too many meetings recently doing two things at once. It's terrible distraction and easy to do, um, but something to be awfully careful of in, in that first impression. Yeah. Um, so Aditi, we're gonna wrap up these questions with a last one to you. How much is too much communication? Where's the line and, and how do you draw it? I think you have to read the audience, right? Initially, when you're starting, you really have to just sit back, listen, be a sponge, absorb it all, understand the culture, not only in the company, the department and the team. They're, they could be different, right? Not, not, not totally different, but they're, they have these little nuances, like if, depending on which city you're sitting in will be a little different. And then within the department itself, so really absorb it all in. Initially, like I said, um, ask as many questions. Too, too much communications is okay. You, if you're asking the right questions and not too many times the same question, um, I think it's okay. Like you can ask. Um, now, come day 90th day, you don't know answer to a question you should have known, um, you know, three months ago then either you're asking it in, you know, you need to rephrase it or you ask somebody else uh, if it's not clear. But I would say initially you've got to figure things out. People know that um, teams understand it. Take that time um, that they're willing to give you um, initially to, you know, sort of make you part of the team and ask as many questions as you can. No, not, not too much communication is bad. And I mean, too much communication is not bad initially. And then you learn what the trend in the team is or what the culture of the team is. Absolutely agreed on, on all of that. Thank you for that. Sure. Um, before we slide into our Q&A time, and I, I think we accomplished our somewhat of a 35 minute window. So kudos to everybody, congrats and good job. Um, we're gonna slide into our Q&A here and there's some great questions coming in. But before we do, just for the panelists, is there anything that, that was left un uncovered that we'd like to cover or share with the audience? No? Okay, good. Um, so I, I guess I'm going to uh, pull up these, these Q&As. There's, there's a lot of great questions here. And I don't know if we'll have time to get through all of them, but I will do my best uh, to, to actually get answers out if possible um, through, uh, through this group to, to any unanswered questions. And certainly happy to have anyone reach out after the fact. You can find me on LinkedIn and shoot over a question. Happy to get answers from the panelists or from myself. Um, so just in, in random order, I think we'll throw out a simple one to start to the panelists. What's the best time to update your LinkedIn profile once accepting a new position? Um, I think it, it depends if you've given your, well, it depends, right? If it's your first job, you can always say incoming, you know, intern or incoming business analyst into this role. Um, but I think if you are switching roles, um, wait till it's your first day at the new job. Just give that respect to the company that you're leaving. Um, and, and so those are my two instances, yeah. Yeah, couldn't agree, agree with that more. Agree. Um, okay, so I, I think this is a good one because we've, we've spent a good amount of time sowing culture through this conversation tonight. How can we tell if a company has a good culture before actually accepting a new role with them? Oh, that's a good question. And I, I think it's what's a good culture or what's a good fit for you as an individual, right? Um, because you'll wanna make sure that the, the company is right for you and the company that's right for you may not be the company that's right for your best friend or, or somebody, um, someone else. I think there are a few ways to find out about the company culture. You know, and some of them are Glassdoor, you know, to get, to get, unfortunately, a lot of the negative comes out of Glassdoor, but it gives you an understanding of what, what the positives and negatives are. 
go onto the company website, speak to employees during the interview itself, you know, to ask that question, how do you define the company culture? What does it mean to you? What do you like the most about it? And ask that question or various questions along the way to the different people that you're meeting with. And you'll be able to find out what is important and to see if it aligns to what's important to you and to your values. Um, you know, and then there's always just the standard, you go on social media, you know, and, and you can see what's being said on, on, on um, something like LinkedIn or Instagram. But I think those are also indicators of what's important to a company culture. I think about what we at Ralph Lauren put out onto our Instagram. And it so, makes me so happy that during interviews, I could say we live it. Um, and so if you look on, on social media and you're sensing certain things, you can also ask those questions. Of what does that mean? Um, in, in reality, in the day to day of the, of the company. Yeah, that's very helpful, Elaine. I, I, we always try very hard to dissuade people from Glassdoor as a forum or Yelp or any of those review sites. They're, they're an advertising model and they're not gonna attract advertisers for people coming on writing, this is the best company, thank you. It's, 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 a, it's a forum for, for negative first, unfortunately. Right, right. Right. Um, but a company that only has negative is one that you should <laughs> and that can be an indicator when right. when the best thing is the smoothies, you know, there's a problem, right? <laughs> yep, absolutely. Exactly. That's exactly right. But I, you know, I think LinkedIn is a very powerful tool and more so than people realize. And a lot of the coaching we give to, to, to support, like how you find out about culture is do a search on LinkedIn for people you went to college with, high school with that are working at that company, like you're able to just pull up a search result of anybody who works at that company today or has worked at that company you're applying to and see if you have a nexus through something you've done, another another career, another, you know, whatever it may be, or an, part of your education. Maybe you find somebody you have a familiarity with, you send them a quick note, no better referral or insight than from somebody you can trust. Um, not always gonna work, but it, it's certainly a helpful tool. So moving to our next uh, question, there, there are two here that, that have a lot of synergy. So I'll, I'll throw both of them out. But the first question is, if you do not get the position that you're interviewing for, do you think it's appropriate to reach out and ask what you could do to improve upon regarding your interview skills or some deficiency you might've had? How do you three feel about receiving that those inquiries? I I don't mind that question. I think the challenge is sometimes there isn't a definitive answer, right? I think the candidate wants a concrete, tangible something that they can do differently. Sometimes you can give them that, right? Like, hey, I remember I had one interview, it'll, it'll go down in the history books as the craziest interview that I ever had. And I was able to very clearly answer that question for him about what he should not do um, you know, in an interview. But in most interview situations, it really comes down to, you know, th there, there's a candidate that their experience is a little stronger in this area, or they, their communication skills were a little bit stronger. They answered these questions. They had a little bit more experience. So there isn't this like huge concrete thing that you can always say, do this you would have gotten the job, right? And I think that that's frustrating for candidates because I understand the ask and the why behind the question, but just respect the fact that as a recruiter, there isn't always a great answer for that, right? It's just, hey, this candidate interviewed a little bit better. They had a little bit more of this experience, a little bit more of that background, um, you know, whatever it may be. And that's what kind of edged them over you. Yeah, just just echoing what Tony said. Tim, we get them all the time, right? Uh, can you give me some feedback so I can be better in the next interview? Um, a lot from obviously, if you had two finalists and um, so the one that didn't get selected, and and similar, it's just the other um, candidate was a little bit stronger. Sometimes you can if it's a technical role, like you know they had more SAP experience or PLM or whatever it may be. Um, but yeah, same. It's okay to ask though. It's okay to email and ask the um, contact HR contact that question. 
Awesome. Thank you both. So sticking with that that theme, what can someone do if they're turned down for a role that they wanted in, in terms of keeping in touch? You know, this is their dream company, for instance, but they got turned down. Are, do you have any recommendations on how they can keep in touch or should they keep in touch? I invite candidates to keep in touch with me, right? So that's just one of the things like personally, my philosophy is if, if you took the time to interview with me, you're going to get a phone call, right? Whether you got the job or didn't get the job, I'm going to pick up the phone and I'm going to call you and I'm going to let you know the status. And if I think that's a great candidate that we want in this organization, but maybe this just wasn't the right fit or to Aditi's comment, right? That there's somebody else that just slightly inched them out. Um, then I will tell candidates, you know, Feel free to continue to peruse our careers page, mark down alert so you can be the first to know if these types of positions become available. And then don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm not the recruiter for most of the jobs in our company, but I know who is, right? And I will, I'm more than willing to forward a resume and say, hey, spoke to this candidate, you know, a month ago for XYZ job. Um, here's my thoughts opinion on the candidate, take a look at their resume and please consider them, right? So that's half the battle is just finding somebody that's going to look at your resume, right? And then you have to understand that they may come back and say, yep, we took a look at it. Sorry, you're not the right fit for the role. And you kind of say, all right, I, I, I did what I could do. I reached out. I asked the question. They said, thanks, but no thanks. Now I need to move on. But I, I think it's always okay to at least reach out with you know, something like, hey, we spoke a couple of months ago, I saw this position on your website, and I'm wondering, um, might I be a good fit for it, right? Very open-ended, leave it to the recruiter, you know, what he or she wants to do with that. Thank That's you, great. Tony. I would also say, you know, connect on LinkedIn, you know, and just make sure that, um, you know, you're kind of always visible in a, in a lot of ways. I think that's the most critical thing that we could suggest to anyone is visibility. You want to be relevant. You want to make sure you're, you know, and to Tony's point, you're finding a job online. You certainly don't want to say, well, don't forget me. This role's open and I could make sense for something that makes absolutely no sense for you. Um, so you want to be relevant, but you want to, you want to be consistently non-annoyingly visible, <laughs> uh, which yeah, is yeah. A, a delicate dance. Yeah, and connect on LinkedIn because a lot of the recruiters, like we would advertise on our own uh, posts or pages. So mm -hmm. it'll show up on their feed and they can immediately send us an email or whatever it may be or comment on the post. Yeah. One word of caution I would say with that. So I had a little bit of an assertive individual on LinkedIn, right? And he had reached out and said, hey, I see you guys have an XYZ position. And it was a VP role. And um, I said, yep, we do, you know, send me your resume. I'd be happy to get it in the appropriate hands. So, you know, I did just that. He sent me his resume. I sent it over. And um, so I was like, check, I did my job. And I, I told him if the recruiter's interested, she will contact you. Um, and it was probably three weeks later, he reached out again and basically said, you know, hey, I saw this job is still open and nobody has contacted me. And I said, you know, I, I referred your resume to the recruiter. If they're interested, they will reach out. And he said, well, it's on your LinkedIn page. So I think what he thought was because the job was posted under my LinkedIn that I was the recruiter and I was somehow being dishonest with him just to get him to go away. And I, and I came back with, well, we have a service that just automatically posts random jobs on all of our LinkedIn accounts. So you may see a job that's on a recruiter's LinkedIn profile that they are not necessarily the recruiter for. So just be cautious in assuming that because it's on Tony Freeland's LinkedIn, that Tony Freeland is the one actually managing that particular job. So a recruiter who's not in-house like the three of you's translation of that is do not piss off talent acquisition <laughs> at the company where you want to work. Period. <laughs> politely went back and explained, hey, we have a service. Right. I'm not lying. Like, you know, I'm not <laughs> recruiting for the job. Right. Right. So it, it was just interesting because he was probably a little bit more assertive than what um, he maybe should have been in that situation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that, Tony. 
So next question for you guys, and I think we have time for just a couple more here. Um, what is the best way a candidate can stand out on their resume and get a first interview? What are things that stand out for you in, in resumes that are coming through? It's a nice curve. I'll take it. Um, yeah, it, it's <laughs> always hard, right? Um, there's so many different versions of resumes. Like I, I remember the day um when it used to be you know this is the format going nowadays like this is the format to use now it's it's not you can use so many different uh versions of uh, how resume should be written um i would say you know put more in your current role that you're doing or your last one than in everything else even if it's been a longer like you you might have right the role you're moving on from, you've been there two years, but prior to that, you've been there with the company 15 years. I want to know more about more recent role. It gives me um, more of a depth and not to say that don't, you know, write, but don't write, you know, three pages of the 15 years and then just, you know, um, a quarter of a page for your current one, but also more bullet points, something that quickly takes my eyes to what I want to see, no paragraph form, don't necessarily always need a definite um, um, information on what company you're working for and what they do. Sometimes there's like a full, you know, um, introduction from wherever um, Google, LinkedIn, or th their actual um, website of what the company does. Don't need that. So it needs to be quick, something your eye draws to quickly. Pictures unnecessary. Um, I know some people put them on. It's it's okay. Uh, but they're definitely, you can do without them. Um, but that's that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at quickly scanning them. We look to so many. I cannot read through a paragraph. Give me bullet points. You know, if you want to highlight some of the things, that's fine. Um, but yeah, definitely bullet points and, and quick reads. I have two tips. I could go on this question for a week, right? Like I have done training courses on this question. So I'll keep it to two tips. My first one would be don't apply for every job in the company, right? Be selective in looking at the job. And if you are not remotely qualified, do not apply for that job because that's just frustrating and irritating to a recruiter when you see a job that has 10 years of experience, you're a brand new college graduate and you're applying. You're like, did you even look at the job description? And that leads into my second question, look at the job description, right? read that job description and customize your resume to it. So when you're looking over the skills, the qualifications, you want to have bullet points, duties, skills, something that's calling that out, right? So what I tell people to do is look at your resume side by side with that job and go down those list of qualifications. And if it says, you know, effective communicator, what do I have on my resume that demonstrates that I'm an effective communicator? And you go bullet by bullet by bullet on that job description so that every single one of those um, skills and qualifications is addressed in some way, shape, or form in your resume. And that leads to the third point, which is customize it. It is not a one-size-fits-all resume. For every job that you are applying for, you should be reading that job description and customizing that resume so that it's a fit for that particular job. I, I guess with the, the, the last minute or so that we have, if I can just keep going on that question, it's not part of the Q&A, but I think it has a lot of relevance. You know, for Ralph Lauren, for, for Wolverine, for PVH, you all have portals where, where candidates are applying or on LinkedIn, they'll, they'll click the easy apply jobs and come in and it goes into your, your ATS and, and you're managing those applications. How do you feel about candidates finding your profile online and emailing you directly about the job versus applying to the job? Mm. <laughs> I would prefer application, you know, uh, online. Um, we, in fact, if somebody just drops me an email and I get those sometimes, they'll reach out on LinkedIn, they'll find my email address. The first thing I always say is, thank you for your interest in, you know, the ex job at Ralph Lauren. If you have not applied, please do so, All right? I will take a look at the resume um, and I will forward it to the appropriate recruiter. 
but the expectation is that application is actually submitted and, and, and our recruiting team will not speak to an applicant unless they're truly an applicant, which means that they've applied online. But, um, you know, if it's somebody who I know and I have been connected to, we talked about, you know, uh, Tony was talking about the, the candidates who didn't get a job, right? And how do you stay connected? If that person sends the resume and, you know, I would still say, please make sure you apply. But, you know, that does happen um, as well. And, and that's a good thing. And we, we pass it on. But I like the, the person to actually apply first and say, I've applied for this position. Yep. Awesome. Thank you, Elaine. I, I, I know we have to wrap up here. It's seven o'clock. Um, just from a Q&A perspective, there are a bunch of questions we didn't get to. Please feel free to find me if it's helpful on LinkedIn. Um, just my first and last name. I'm happy to answer any questions and help support anyone in the process. Thanks, Brian. Uh, not surprisingly, you were a deft moderator. Very appreciative. And, and thanks to DT, Elaine and Tony. Uh, so helpful, so thoughtful and, and really inspiring. I know to the students that were able to listen in and this is recorded and will be made available to our other scholars, our alums and our applicants. So thank you all for such a great session. For those who are viewing our next masterclass, our first one of the summer is on Thursday and it would be, it will be a conversation um, that Diane von Furstenberg will be having with the editor-in-chief of Vogue.com, Kio Manati. So I encourage everybody to tune in at 12 o'clock for that. Thanks again, panelists. Thanks, Brian, for being such a great partner to the FSF. Uh, good night. Thanks, everyone. Good night, everyone.